Hey, my name is Michael Lodge, and I'm the speaking pastor here at Cascade Community Church. And I'm so glad that you've found this video, and, and I hope that it helps you understand the love of God and draws you into living life with Him. But I want to encourage you, don't let this be a substitute for being plugged into the local body. Wherever you are, find that connection. And if you're here in Monroe, we cannot wait to live life with you at church. So come and get plugged in. Light of eternity, ancient of days, glorious in holiness, worthy of praise, wonderful counselor.
rising eyes are turning to you we turn to you so hope is stirring hearts are yearning for you we long for you cause when we see here at Cascade. I am so glad you are joining us online today. If you are new here, would you please fill out the digital communication card in the description of this video. That will allow us to get to know you and you can get to know us better as well by submitting any questions you might have. This digital connect card is also a place to submit needs and prayer requests. We look forward to hearing from you. I want to share with you two ways that you can serve our community as we ramp up into the holiday season. First of all, it's October. And what that means is it's Socktober here at Cascade. Cascade is collecting socks of all kinds and sizes to help with those in need this winter. Simply drop new socks off at Cascade anytime during the month of October. We're also partnering with Sky Valley Food Bank for a Thanksgiving food drive for our neighbors in need. We got a very special list of non-perishable food items that the food bank is asking for. You can find that list on our website, the app, or in the Generosity Project Facebook group. Drop off donation items at Cascade October 24th through November 4th. Thanks for living generously and serving our community in Monroe. We're so glad you're here today now let's dive into this week's message on the Gospel of John series. It's good to be in here, and it's good for me to hear your voices. Sometimes I don't sing worship in the morning because I'll probably lose my voice because I just get really loud really quick. So I just listen, and just hearing you worship is just so encouraging to me. Uh, just the songs that we're singing, lifting up the name of Jesus, lifting up the name of God, who he is, and how he changes everything in our life. Let me just ask you, is it, is it good to be in the presence of God Almighty? It is so good. It's so good. So thank you for being here. Um, this morning, uh, I want to ask you to open up to John 
chapter 2. We've, we've turned the lights up some so that you can have the Bibles in front of you. Um, just want to ask that, that you bring your Bibles. Look on with someone who has one. We want you to interact with the Word of God. Have a relationship with the Word of God because it is so good. Um, so we're reading about something that I love today. Uh, one of my favorite stories that just made children's ministry and youth ministry so much fun growing up is when Jesus comes in and is just a spectacle to the world. Do you know what a spectacle is? Okay, not the things that you put on your, your eye. It's like this is an old term for, for eyeglasses. But a spectacle is when somebody does something really big and it gets everybody's attention and often it changes everything. Uh, and just thinking about the word and what Jesus did, I was thinking about different spectacles that we've seen happen uh, in America in and, and, and 1903. How many of you guys remember good old 1903, right? No, okay, not, e- not even a single person. All right, that's, that's probably best. Um, 1903, something really big happened when a couple of brothers got together and wanted to defy gravity. Who are we talking about? The Wright brothers. In 1903, the Wright brothers, these, these two guys got together and defied gravity. Like, I, I like to think, I don't know who's who in this picture, but I'm just assuming the brothers on the two ends and the stepbrothers in the middle, <laughs> right? But in, in 1903, they showed the world, and photographers were there, and, and people with these, these old school video cameras were catching this, and just news spread all over America, all over the world. Man has defied gravity. That happened in North Carolina. I'm sure there's someone out here in Washington that was just like, it's a conspiracy. I don't know if I believe that. Something else has got to be going on, right? Like the the, the news was just so big. Like um, wrap your brains around what that must have been like to have been alive. And all of a sudden, man can defy gravity. We can fly. Did that change much in America? It changed a lot. And 60 years later, another spectacle went happen. When all of America were, were, were on the edge of their couch, tuning in their TV, all black and whites, and like listening to the radio as they listened to Neil Armstrong. When humanity progressed and like we went so far from just like defying gravity, we went to the moon. And everyone in America was listening in to, to his first words as he stepped out onto this new service. And, and man did more than just fly. We, we flew to the moon. That defied everything. News spread all over the world. And then last week, 60 years later, Captain James T. Kirk. <laughs> thanks to Jeff Bezos. He, just, he got just above the atmosphere. And for the small price of like $300,000 or $55 million, I'm not sure what it was that he paid, but he paid to get out of the atmosphere into the stratosphere just for 11 minutes. Money well spent, amen? Which just means for us, this is right around the corner when we're gonna be jumping on these things and like, nah, I I ain't paying nothing to do that, right? Like there's, there's no way. But I was just thinking about how over the course of 120 years, these, these moments that just defined everything, that changed humanity, these spectacles that happened. What we're reading about today in John chapter two, Starting in verse 13, like like Jesus steps into the temple and he does something that that we just see and and, and immediately we just think that Jesus does something that was kind of shocking to the world. But what he does here in chapter 2 challenges humanity. It redefines humanity. He does something that is amazingly offensive. Did you know that Jesus could be offensive? I had a friend that said that she never wanted to really read any of the letters of Paul because Paul was just very offensive in everything that he read, but, but she loved to read about Jesus because Jesus was just super sweet. I'm not sure what Jesus she was reading. And I'm not sure what Jesus you've been encountering. But today, I, I just want you to be ready that in what he does today, he offends the world. Buckle up and get ready to be offended because Jesus with a big old smile on his face is getting ready to offend you and me. Okay, so open up 
to John chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 13. Listen to what Jesus does here. It says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. Come on. That's my Jesus, right? Like, I don't need the soft-spoken, like, blonde Norwegian-looking Jesus that are up on everybody's, like, Southern Baptist walls. Like, this, this is my Jesus. Listen to this. Jesus puts together, making a whip, of course, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. Can you imagine that? Like, just think about that. He steps into the temple. Okay? And the temple, the temple's a little bit bigger than campus here at Cascade Community Church. Okay, the temple, like get your head around this, is 36 acres big. 36 acres, that's like over 20 football fields all crammed together. So Jesus steps in here into the temple, and remember what the temple is. The temple is not just a place that they go to church, or it's not just a place that they read the scriptures. The temple, for thousands of years, is where God's people ran to to experience the full and great and powerful presence of God. The presence of God, the fullness of God, the divinity of God, the power of God rested in the middle of the temple. So for thousands of years, God's people would come to the temple for safety, for rescue, for comfort, for peace, to know that they were in the presence of God. But over the past thousand years, something started to shift in humanity. Humanity did what they always do. They started to lose sight of God and place themselves in the middle of the world. So when Jesus steps in and he looks around at this temple, and it's supposed to be the place where everybody comes to to experience the presence of God, he looks around and nobody is there for the right reasons. Nobody understands what it means to come into the presence of God, and no one realizes that they're actually not able to enter into the presence of God. And that's when Jesus started going to town. And it says he clears out, like just imagine on this 36 acres, this man with a whip screaming at the top of his voice, chasing people out and driving cattle out of the temple. Do you see that? And then Jesus turns around and starts coming back in the temple, and it says this, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned tables. Jesus just starts walking back in and just starts flipping tables, taking things up, and yeet, just like straight across, right? Just ripping everything open. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Have you ever heard about people respecting the house of God? Like I know when I was a little kid, like I was a a pastor's kid, so the the church was kind of like my, my second playground. I was there all the time, going into rooms, like just getting into things that I probably shouldn't be getting into, climbing up in the attic. And and it was not uncommon for me just to be running around chasing my friends in the hallways of the church until I bumped into that grumpy old deacon who would grab me by the ears and just say, not in the house of God, right? Just not on my watch. There will be no smiles and no fun happening inside of this church building. It is a reverent place where only holy actions happen, right? Like, I, I had so many experiences of that. And a lot of times we read this and we, we hear about the zeal that Jesus had for the house of God. And, and we think that what that means is that we're not supposed to sell coffee in our churches, right? And I know there's some of you in here, I'm not gonna call you out by name, but you stepped foot in the, the door and it was the first day that we had church merchandise and you thought of this story, <laughs> And you were tempted, be honest, you were tempted to go to the table and just, whoops, right? Because that's not right. We're not supposed to do that in the house of God. But what we don't understand here is like, it's not just talking about selling things inside of the church. And like what was happening here was so out of proportion. The Sadducees were the ones that controlled the temple. 
They were the ones that, that ran the Levites, that, that, that would interact with everything in the temple ground. And, and what they were doing is that they were using this. They weren't selling the oxen and the pigeons and the goats at cost, right? This is something that happened for thousands of years. You would come to the temple and you would buy the sacrifice so that you could make the sacrifice. And then and the, the Levite, the, the, the priest would make the sacrifice for you and, and cleanse you of your sins. Like that, that's happened for a long time. But what was happening now, what had been changing over the past hundreds of years is that the Sadducees that had taken control of the temple were using these offerings and using these sacrifices, the money that was coming in, they were double charging and triple charging and quadruple charging, and they were stuffing their pockets full of wealth. Archaeologists have uncovered the homes of Sadducees. In the basements of these homes, they've found wine collections with bottles that, that if you would, would compare it to today's currency, they would, they would be worth thirty to $40,000 a bottle of wine. They would uncover these mosaics and just the decorations that were in these houses and just the lavish life that the Sadducees were living because they were abusing the temple. They were abusing it. They were using the religious system for their own personal gain. Does that sound familiar at all? You think of the prosperity gospel and just the different forms of Christianity that are out there today and how so many people, they view Jesus, they view Christianity as just the, the next best and greatest Santa Claus to come into their life. How can this religious system benefit me? And Jesus was stepping in and he was seeing this, this gross corruption. It's like not on my watch. And he did something scandalous. He did something that was a spectacle so that he could make the way to say something spectacular. Listen to what Jesus says next. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you do to show us for doing these things? Pretty much they were looking at Jesus and they were asking the question, who do you think you are? Have you ever been bold enough to say that to Jesus? All of us, let's be honest. So they asked Jesus, who do you think you are? Like, give us a sign to show us for doing these things. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up again. And then the Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up again in three days? I was just reading in 1 Kings and in, in, in chapter 4, it's talking about the building of the first temple. And they were saying here that this is the second temple that they were referring to, and it took almost 50 years to build it. You read in 1 Kings, they had an army of over 183,000 men working on this temple every single day for over 50 years. And now Jesus is standing in front of them, and he's saying, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. And they were just looking at him like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And these words were so odd and so strange that they stuck in the back of the disciples' minds. And in verse 21, we read, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. It's amazing how Jesus just slides that three-day thing in there. Like just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the wedding at Cana and how the third day was the day of redemption, the day that the wedding took place. And now Jesus was referring again to something that is going to happen on the third day that will change absolutely everything. And when, therefore, he was raised from the dead on the third day, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture, and the word that Jesus had spoken. And you've got to circle that word believed. It's so important. Jesus was saying this thing. He just did this incredible act, this spectacle that got everyone's attention. Every ear was bent looking at what was happening in the far corner of the temple grounds. And then these words started echoing through the courtyards. This man is saying that he will raise this temple up in three days. See, Jesus was speaking specifically to the Sadducees here. And the Sadducees were looking around, and one of the reasons why they were getting so hot and angry right now is because Jesus was putting everything on the line for them. 
Jesus was challenging everything that was happening inside of the temple in this moment. And when you look at the temple, when you look at the inside of the temple, you see that these 36 acres was just a step-by-step-by-step process for, for men and women to step closer into the presence of God until you could get to the closest point here where only the priests were allowed to go in further from here. And the priest would take whatever sacrifice you would bring and they would put it up on this altar. And this altar is not just like a little four-burner Weber that we have in our backyard, okay? This altar was literally the size of the stage. And they would just mount cows and goats and pigeons all up here and burn them before the Lord, make the sacrifice for the people so that the people could be forgiven so that they can know a sacrifice had been made, so that they can be confident that they can experience some of the presence of God. And that the, the priest would go to the water basin and they would cleanse themselves, purify themselves, like what we talked about at the wedding. And they would go through the first veil. And they would interact with the next thing. The lampstand would be sitting right there and it would be lit. It was always lit because the light was a symbol of the presence of God being in the temple. And on the other side, the, the table of bread, where the holy sacrifices that were made with bread offerings were put on the table and the, the Levites would eat from this table. And then a little further, the altar of incense, which just symbolized the prayers going up to God and the connection that the priests were able to have on behalf of the people with the presence and the power of God. But only one man was able to step beyond that and go through the great second curtain and step into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the pure, divine glory and power of God remained. The temple. The temple that signified where people came to, to experience and to know and to be in the presence of God. But unaware, not knowing that, that they had no clue that they were unable to experience the kingdom of God, the power of God, the presence of God. And Jesus was stepping in to redefine some things and to say some things that were incredibly offensive specifically to the temple and the temple process. When you remember back at the beginning of chapter one that we read several weeks ago in verse 14, after John had talked about Jesus being in the beginning with God and he was God and he was the word, and then in verse 14, he says this, the word made, was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. And that word dwelling literally means tabernacle, where Jesus made his tabernacle, his temple with us. So Jesus stepped out of heaven into humanity in the form of a little baby and grew into being a man. And as he's standing before the people right now, he's saying that my body is the temple of God. You've been coming to this temple, but I stand before you now, and I want the world to know that the full presence and power and glory of God is in my body. Can you think of anything more offensive than that? He stood before them in verse 19. He said, my body is the temple, and if you destroy this body, I will raise it again on the third day to show you who I really am. They were asking the question, who do you say that you are? Give us a sign to prove to us that you can do the things that you're claiming to be able to do. And what we see is from this story for the next 10 chapters, almost every chapter, Jesus presses pause and he says this, I want you to know exactly who I am. And he uses those words in chapter eight. He says, I am before Abraham. Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am, and, and he was using this phrase, the word I am, which was the name of God. So whenever you hear Jesus say, I am, he is saying something that no man should ever say. He is saying that I am the full presence and power and divinity of God. I am, I always have been, I always will be. And those words become the gateway for him to, to challenge and to offend the Sadducees even further because he would always say, I am something, and he would fill in the blank. And what we see is that he was saying that I am the temple. We're going to see that, but the, the, the word I am, the name of God, the power of God, was something that they took so serious 
that no one would ever utter the name of God. No one would ever say the word I am. That's a name that is written in scriptures all through the Old Testament more than 6,000 times. And as they would write out these words, as they would write out the Psalms, as they would write out the Torah, every time they would come to the name of God, they would put their quill down, they would go off to the purifying water, and they would baptize themselves, come back ready to write the name of God, and they would use a different pen for every letter of the name of God. Because they held it in such reverence. There was so much power just in the name. That's because all through scripture, what God had always been doing was trying to reveal himself. Do you know who I am? Do you know how powerful, how great, how mighty I am? Because if you can come to me for who I am, then I will change everything in your world. And you see this graphically written in Psalm 91. In just the first two verses, you hear so many of the names of God. Four times he gives us a different name. Listen to this. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. El Roy. The Most High. The Creator. The God that began everything. The God that was and always will be. He who dwells in the shelter of El Roy, of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, the All-Powerful One, El Shaddai. I will say to the Lord, and, and the Lord, the word Lord is the word that we put in place of the name of God that we just can't even say. So every time you see that in Scripture, it is that name that is so powerful that you can't even let your lips say it, but then look what he says, my refuge and my fortress, my God, Elohim, in whom I trust. Where the author, whether it was David or Moses, like the, the person who was writing this was, was declaring to the world, this almighty, all-powerful, all-creative God that I know personally, I'm able to say his name because he is my God. The power of God wrapped up in this. And the reason why the author would, would write these psalms and always come back to the name of God is the same reason why all of our worship songs, if you think about all the worship songs we just got done singing, we just fi finished singing about the name of God over and over and over again. And the psalms are the same way. It's a repetitive time for our hearts to sit in the reality of who God is. Because if we know who he is, then it puts us in our proper place. When David was running for his life and he was scared about the armies that were chasing after him, what did he remind himself of? Did he remind himself about how great of a warrior he was? Did he talk about the skills that he had and what he could do to defeat Goliath on his own? Is that what David reminded himself of? Over and over again, when David was in a place of fear, when his life was on the line over and over again, David would remind himself of the great and mighty name of God. But for thousands of years, people have been hanging on to other things. And for the Sadducees, with the temple court, for hundreds of years, they were learning how to use this religious system for their own personal gain. And they were holding on to their flesh. They were holding on to the pleasures of life. They were holding on to everything that they wanted out of life instead of holding on to God. And I've been thinking about it this week, and I kind of see it as a box of lucky charms. Our faith, our religion, the temple system, how great and powerful it was, was reduced to a box of lucky charms. For the Sadducees, everything that was happening in the temple was for their own personal wealth and for what they could get out of life. It wasn't for the presence of God. It wasn't for knowing who he was. They held on to their own desires, their own pleasures instead of God. And when Jesus steps in here, what we hear every single time, every single one of the I am statements is an offensive statement to the Sadducees' temple system. When you look at this, you see every single one of the things that you find in the temple and how Jesus was saying, you are holding on to those as a means for your own satisfaction, but I want you to hold on to me. 
Don't you love how Jesus offends people when it's not you? (laughs) All through the gospel, Jesus is revealing who he is as a way of telling the Sadducees, I just want to make this clear. I am because you are not. And it's laid on top of the temple system. But what's interesting is that he doesn't stop at just offending the Sadducees. Man, I love it. He ascends the Pharisees too, right? The Pharisees who have used the word of God, the Torah, as their means of achievement. And it reminds me of this. Everyone's favorite cereal, cereal, right? This thing is flying off the shelf. Everyone wants all brand because it is the most flavorless cereal that's out there. And for the Pharisees, they looked at the word of God and they had all of these things where they would tell people to go to the word of God, hold on to the word of God, add to the word of God. They had volumes of works called the Mishnah that they would add to the word of God because they didn't think people had enough of the word of God. You need more rules. You need more effort. You need more ability to achieve righteousness so that you can experience God. The Pharisees wanted to be in control. Anyone out there struggle with wanting to be in control? Finding a way to manipulate God to tell him what he owes you because of what you've done in this world? Finding ways to control your own life? Every single one of these statements, what we see Jesus flipping the tables was not just to the Sadducees, it was also to the Pharisees. Because he wanted them to realize, you're holding on to something that is not me. And we love how Jesus offends other people, but it's amazing that Jesus took the next step and offended everybody else. Those statements are are written to the other Jews, the other Greeks, the Gentiles that were all around that were looking to different Greek gods. And what's amazing is all of Jesus's I am statements are also an offensive statement against what these Greek gods cannot do. The first one being series, which we, where we get the word serial, which is where all of these illustrations came from. It just got me thinking, like, you're right, you know. And for the Herodians, it's like raisin bran. You take bran and try to make it good by adding a bunch of sugary, unhealthy raisins, right? I tried to convince my wife, this is healthy cereal. It's got bran in it. And she's like, you have so much sugar, it ruins everything that's there that's meant to be good. And honestly, that's what the Herodians, that's what the Jews, that's what the Gentiles were doing when they were trying to say, all right, this is our faith, this is God, but man, the Greek gods look really good. And there's a lot that this world has to offer. The world's opinion on sex and identity and and pleasure and what's meaningful in life, like that's all really good. Can I just mix both of these together? Jesus steps in and he says something that is incredibly offensive to absolutely everyone. You are holding on to something, but you're not holding on to me. Jesus causes a spectacle. He flips things upside down. He changes everything. He causes a scene, and the spectacle is to challenge us and us to hear the words of Jesus that that he's asking us, like, what what are you running to? What are you going to? And what you see throughout the Gospels is that every time Jesus has an an interaction with someone, he's challenging them, and he's asking them, what are you holding on to? What are you filling your temple with? Last week, we heard the conversation with Nicodemus, and Jesus was looking at him, and, and he was saying, Nicodemus, I got to say something offensive because you're holding on to something that's not me. Jesus talked to the woman at the well in the next chapter and says, you have all of these opinions and understandings. You're running to pleasure in all of these different areas. You're holding on to something that's not me. The rich young ruler with, with money, with Zacchaeus, with money. Like Jesus goes through and he confronts everyone and he says something that is very offensive to everyone. He causes a spectacle so that he can make way to the spectacular. For us to be able to drop what we're holding and to see him for everything that he is and to hold on to him and him alone. 
And I was reading this, and I was reading through uh, Samuel and, and Kings, and, and something just started to come to mind. I just started to see this, this pattern that from the beginning of time, this is what we have been struggling with as humans. In the very beginning, Adam and Eve had the opportunity to hold on to God, to listen to him, to listen to his words, to know him for everything that he was. But then what got in their way? They did. Their choices. God, I know you say this, but this sounds a little bit better. I know you say you're God, but I think maybe I would make a better God. And Adam and Eve started to put their opinions and their desires at the center of the world. And as the Jews were being led out of Egypt and learning to follow God again, what did they fall into the habit of doing over and over again? Looking back, holding on to old things. You read in Joshua and Judges, when people are crying out, like, we want to be like the other nations around us. Give us a king. We want a king. We want a judge. We want someone in charge of us. We want to be like everyone else. We want to experience their life. They wanted to be the captain of their own life. <laughs> like, this, this defines, like, everything that, that we are as humans. We want to be in control. We want to choose our pleasure we want to make God in our own image. We want God to serve us and satisfy us. It's at the heart of the prosperity gospel. It's at the heart of the social justice movement and the gospel that, that is preached through it. We put ourselves in the middle, our opinions, what we want. But so many times, it's not, it's not just this, these things. It's, it's our life. It's the situations that we live in. Coca Krispies, like, I love these, but this time of year, I expected to be able to find it. But do you guys remember um, Count Chocula? Love Count Chocula, right? It's pretty much this, but just with the count on the front of it. But it just made me think, like, with all of the things that are going on in this world, there's a lot of fear in our hearts, whether it's fear of government, whether it's fear of a virus, whether it's fear of being out of control, like this fear is driving us into division. This fear, like you can just feel it. Everybody wants to hold on to something. We want some version of truth. We want some version of control. We want something to hold on to. And because of that, it has created division, it's created anger, it's created this intense, like, cancel culture where you just can't get away with, with anything. There's no grace, there's no forgiveness. You understand the world through my lens, through my eyes, or I'm just not going to have anything to do with you. And at the root of it all is our response in fear. We are looking to hold on to something. And this world is full of options. But today, Jesus is saying, can you just stop and only hold on to me? And this is the picture that he gives us. When, if we go back to this psalm and we hear the names of God and just think, put yourself in the place of David, being fearful of your life, being terrified that you are going to die. But then what does David do? He goes to the name of God and he says, I just want to know who you are, God. And then this beautiful picture is given to us about what it means to really rest, to let go of everything and just trust in who he is. All throughout the Psalms in the Old Testament, you hear this imagery, you read about this imagery about resting in the shadow of God. You, does that sound familiar? Having the wings of God, resting under the shelter of the wings of God, the pinions of God, just weird stuff. It just makes God sound like a big, turkey in the sky, right? Like it's, but, but it, that imagery comes from somewhere. And I, I want to show you this. This is a prayer shawl. This, this dates back to ancient Israel. When they would pray, they would cover themselves in this. And they felt like God was the great father that would do the same thing. And when they would cover their heads, when they would pray, they would often lift out their hands like this. And that looks like a wing, Right? So the picture that we see when we understand what we're reading is when we're, when we're covered by the wings of God, when we're resting in the shelter of his wings, 
we are resting in the embrace of God. So I want to read this next part of the psalm, but with that in mind. Uh, Kitra, I want to ask my daughter to come up here to be an example for this because I, I think this is what our hearts need today to learn to let go of everything and just to be able to rest right here. So imagine Kitra coming to me with all of her anxiety, all of her fear, letting go of her opinions, knowing that she's got a lot of stuff in life to be stressed about because she does. It's a hard life. She lives with me. It's miserable. <laughs> but imagine what it's to, to be her, to be David, and then for this to define everything in your life. Just let go and just hold on to God, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Can you, can you hear it? While you're here, when you're in my arms, when you know who I am, your place is to rest and to trust, to believe in who I am, to believe what I can do in your life. Just stay in my wings, know who I am. Because when you know who I am, then you can find your place in him. You can find your peace, you can find your comfort. But what Jesus is saying when he's stepping into this, when he's stepping into the temple, he's looking around and he's seeing a bunch of people that are holding on to religion for themselves. People that are trying to use religion in their own efforts in a way to, to prove that they're good enough, to prove that they can be in control. Or maybe they're like a bunch of people that are just trying to balance out the best of both worlds and get a little bit of religion and a whole lot of the world just to be the captain of their own life, to respond to all the fears in life. Is this starting to sound familiar at all to you? Maybe sometimes it's, it's just the fact that we have a whole lot of life and feel like we don't have time for God. We're too busy. Like, I've, I've got to go. I've got to figure things out. I've got to continue to put myself in the middle of my world. Maybe we're just filling it up too much, or maybe we just don't have time for a big box of cereal, and we're on the go, and we just don't have time for God. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read his word. I don't have time to look for him. I've, I've got to figure stuff out. What are you holding on to? As we hear, as we read this spectacle of Jesus stepping into our lives and saying, I want you to just let go. Just let go so that you can rest right where you belong. What's so beautiful about this is what you hear in John's gospel is that it says, for all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave you the right to let go of everything and just be a little kid in his arms. The word to believe in his name means to trust in his name. It literally means to let go of everything and put everything you have in his name. So God wants to wrap his arms around you. And what Jesus is saying is that there's nothing in this world that can compare to who I am. So let go of it all and let me be the bread of life. Let me be the light of the world. Let me be the door, the gate. Let me be the good shepherd in your life. Let me be the resurrection. Let me be the way, the truth, the life. Let me be the true vine. And it's not just Jesus saying that. He's echoing back to all the names of God. You want to do a great study that will absolutely change your life? It'll only take you about 60 years to go through the 50 plus names of God and the attributes of who God is and actually apply your life, actually believe in them and live your life as if you really trusted in those names. Do you want to let go of everything and just know the almighty healer? The fortress, the all-knowing God, the God of wrath and the God of grace? 
the God that will give you strength? Because he's standing here just waiting for you to let go so you can hold on. And then at the end of the gospel of John, Jesus starts turning the corner and he says, not only am I awesome, not only is God incredible, but you get to have the Holy Spirit and your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I and all of my greatness will dwell inside of you. And if you can know who I am inside of you, then what do you have to be fearful of? Do you really think you can control life better than what I can do in your life? Do you want to stay the captain or do you want to make me Lord? Because the Holy Spirit is here to give you wisdom and comfort and conviction and truth and sanctification and peace and open up communication between you and the almighty creator. I don't know what you're holding on to. But when you see the image of God wrapping his arms around you, can you listen to Jesus? Can you let him step into your life and offend you and challenge you to drop whatever you're holding on to? Thanks, babe. I paid her well for that. Just want everyone to know. But can we hear the words of Jesus today? Because every single person in this room should be offended. Because every one of us revert and go to hold on to something else. And and today, we are desperate to hold on to things. We want answers. We want safety. We we want something that we can believe in. And you see the way the world is responding and reacting. Jesus is calling out to all of us. And he's saying, there's a lot of peace in knowing who I am. If you can just let go. So as you listen to this today, I am asking the Holy Spirit to speak to all of our hearts. What is your cereal box? I hope I ruined the cereal aisle for you. Every time you walk down that aisle, I just want you to picture Jesus with his arms outspread, just knocking everything down, right? Just look at all the different names and just ask yourself, what does that symbolize in my life? Because if we are honest with ourselves, we're holding on to something. Something is getting in the way of the full embrace of our Savior. Isn't it worth letting go? What are you holding on to? Is it, is it a sin? Is there something in your life that you have made a God that you've been running to for your pleasure or for your safety or just out of the habitual nature of, of your life? Is, is there a sin that you're holding on to? Is there a comfort, a security, an idol in your life that you've put before Jesus? Is it your time schedule? Is it just the way you've built your life? Honestly, as I've been reading through Samuel, one of the convictions that God laid on me is, is when, when I can get stressed and when, when there's a lot of stuff going on in my life. And yet for the past couple of years, there's been a few little things you know, going on. But one of the things that I often do is I, I try to just kind of step away from everything and I just kind of want to pretend like I'm in a different world. And I remember several years ago when I slipped into that pattern in life, it was books. I was just reading like Christian books and sci-fi novels. And I, I just wanted a different reality to live in. And here recently I found myself and God is just shining this light on me. Michael, you're watching a lot of TV. You're just trying to escape. You're trying to be away. Wouldn't it be better if you just push that stuff out and just got back to holding on to me, put me in my rightful place. I don't know what you're hanging on to, but Jesus is stepping into our temples today and he is turning everything upside down. Can you just let Jesus wreck your temple this morning so that you can turn to him for who he is? The reason why this is at the beginning of the gospel and one of the other gospels is put towards the end. And, and honestly, like it, some people have asked, like, did this happen at the beginning? Did it happen at the end? Like, did Jesus do this more than once? I would say absolutely. I think every time he walked through the temple, he was just boop, gotcha. Like turning it over. Like, I don't, I don't think he could ever walk in somewhere and, and not get people's attention. 
But we know that it's been put at the beginning of this gospel because John was trying to get our attention. John wanted to frame everything else that Jesus is going to say. And Jesus is about to show us some amazing things over the next 10 chapters as he declares to the world, this is who I am. But we can't receive that until we've been offended and until our hands are open and our temples have been tossed. So let today be a day to be offended because the gospel starts by offending everybody to let us know that he is because we never can be. And the sooner we stop trying, the quicker we're going to hold on to who he is. So I just want to ask you today, what are you leaving behind? What are you giving up on? What are you laying down so that you can find him to be everything that he is? So I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to go into this last song that has just been incredible. We've, we've sung it at the men's retreat. We've sung it at the staff retreat, and, and Scott has been singing it uh, here. And this is just another one of those times for us to just just take the next five minutes, even if you can only do it for five minutes and then you're gonna like try to take back control after the song. Like, I'll take that, okay? Just for a few minutes, can you lay down whatever it is that you're holding on to and see him to be everything that he is? Jesus, we come before you now. And as weird as it seems, we celebrate the offense of the gospel because it is such good news to recognize that everything around us, including ourselves, pales in comparison to you. Jesus, can we lay it down so that we can finally find ourselves back where we belong, knowing who you are and finding our place in your arms.
and your tithes and your offerings. You can give online or on our app, in person, or by mailing a check to our offices. Remember to like this video, subscribe to our channels, and most importantly, please make sure to share this video so that other people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ too. Thanks for being part of our Cascade family and have a wonderful week.